<laughs> okay, uh, for, the, for the hour between uh, 12 and 1, there are, um, well, I suppose two things that I'd like to do with you. Um, the first is a, I mean, a, what will probably be a fairly short uh, little lecture, and the second, have a bit of a pause where maybe you can get on with your verses, and then I, I have to write them out, but I've got some uh, possible exercises that may or may not be slightly helpful in terms of spotting mistakes. I think this, uh, this session is called on the program something like uh, advanced hexameter technique. I'm not, get, not sure we're going to get that advanced, but I thought it might be a good moment to think about um, a few issues that have arisen already, and also the sort of things you might be trying to look at as you write more than one hexameter. What, what um, possibly, well, what opportunities and also what problems or difficulties there might be in trying to get a really good uh, series of hexameters that make a coherent uh, poem. In terms of um, issues that we've already seen, um, we did have with a, a couple of people uh, a small confusion about this sort of mutant liquid rule, which is a real nuisance uh, pretty often. The way it works is this. Um, within a word, I mean, tenebrae, darkness is a good example. Um, that's naturally short, that's long, of course. With these two letters, mute and liquid, it means that the syllable beforehand, within the word and only within the word, is ambiguous, or ankeps, as it's called. So if you want to have it short, that's fine. If you want to have it long, that's fine. And obviously, that is of convenience for poets. It means that a word like tenebrae can go quite conveniently in two different places in the line. In other words, if you treat the doubtful syllable as long, it goes very neatly at the end of a line, short, long, long, excellent in the uh, end of the fifth and the sixth foot. Equally, if you choose to have it short, 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 long, goes very well just before the caesura, just after the caesura. What you can't do with this uh, mutant liquid business is have one word ending, say, in T, and another word starting, say, in R. Um, in that case, the normal two-consonant rule applies. You most certainly cannot keep that one short. It has definitely got to be lengthened because of the two consonants. As is almost inevitable when people start writing verses, the things that you don't spot are the two-consonant rule uh, and, I mean, its application with uh, letters like M. With M, you've got to remember that an M at the end of the word is going to elide, but that's the only circumstance in which an M does not count as a full consonant. So an M at the beginning of the word obviously is a proper consonant, and so for that matter, if you've got a word ending in um and another word starting with an M, certainly that's two, those are two consonants. Two consonant rule applies, and that's, um, that's long. So not spotting the two consonant rule and not spotting elisions, so in other words, putting two vowels next to each other when you don't want an elision to happen, those are the things that have gone wrong, mostly, in the lines that people have been uh, looking at so far. Michael. What about uh, a word that ends in a short vowel followed by a mute and a liquid beginning the next word? Oh, right, yes. Thank you for, for raising that. In Latin, as opposed to Greek, you never, ever lengthen a vowel at the end of the word just because the next word might have two consonants to start with. So regardless whether they're mute liquid or not. I mean, I did mention, perhaps rather confusingly, um, yesterday the, the issue of uh, sort of a heavy, heavy consonants, as one might call them. In other words, not a, not a mute and a liquid, but something with an S in. Um, that rather sort of worried some Roman poets. But even then, they never did the Greek practice of uh, lengthening an end vowel. So, I mean, if you've got a, a word ending in a, a short A, for example, regardless of what the next word starts with, I mean, T R or S C or, or whatever. I mean, so obviously that's a mutant or liquid, that's not. In either case, that stays unchanged, as it is. You most certainly do not lengthen that because of what follows. The, um, the two constant rule applies within a word, so obviously if something ends in unt or ant or whatever, those are two constants within the same word, of course they lengthen that. It applies between words, so you've got something naturally short like it, you're following it with a consonant in the next word, again, regardless of what those consonants are. And remember, of course, that, um, well, Lewis and Short 
actually prints them as J's, I mean that, that the letter I can be a vowel and it can be a consonant, so um, the word yam, which Lewis and Short prints as jam, um, that's a consonantal I and is treated as a consonant in all respects, including applying the two consonant rule. And the same obviously applies to the letter U or V if you want to spell it that way. So you need to remember when, you've, when you're dealing with, uh, with I's, J's, U's, V's, are you dealing with a vowel or a consonant? Because the consonantal forms of those letters are treated as consonants in every respect, including for the two consonant rule. And H is never a consonant. It's merely a sort of uh, clearing of the throat. So um, a word like, uh, like Hugh, or, or Hugh, I, I pronounce it, hey, however you want to pronounce it, is a single syllable, and that is not a consonant. So if you have something ending in a vowel like that, before that, it's going to elide, um, which might or might not be helpful. And otherwise, H you just ignore. It's not a consonant in any way. Now, uh, most of this is obviously familiar to most of you, but I've one or two of you have, have asked me about some of these issues. I hope it's uh, helpful to clarify them. Are there any sort of issues of that nature that anybody is unclear about? I mean, how, how these things work technically? Obviously, if, if they come up later on, or, or I see that it seems to have been a problem as I look at something you've done, obviously we'll deal with it uh, again then. Okay, so let's um, move on to maybe slightly more exciting issues of, um, well, what, what I sort of rather pompously call advanced hexameters technique. What, what do you want to do to make your continuous series of hexameters interesting? Oops. And I think the first issue to think about is variety. If you look at a continuous, continuous series of hexameters, I mean, by any ancient or more recent um, Latin author, you'll see that there is a, a degree of variety in the way they do things. Now, there are several places in which you need a bit of variety. One of them is um, where you have your pauses, because it's very boring if every hexameter is a single line, complete in itself, stopped at the end, that's that, have a new sentence in the next line. If you're only doing two or three lines, of course, that's no problem. But the more you do, the more it is necessary to have variety in the places where you pause. And of course, you don't always have to pause at the most obvious places. I mean, at the end of a line, at, <coughs> at the main caesura, those are natural pausing places, and certainly you should have pauses there pretty often. But it is perfectly possible to have a sense pause at more or less any point in the hexameter. It's a bit silly to have one about one foot before the end or something like that, but um, any sensible place, we'll have a look at Virgil, see where he pauses. I think that's the, uh, the best way to think of that. So variety of pausing points, and obviously by a pause I mean the places where we, we would put pu punctuation, whether it's only a comma or whether it is a full period or full stop um, or a semicolon or, what or whatever. I'm thinking of a sense pause of any <coughs> nature. So, um, and obviously a related issue to that is um, when you run on from one line to another, what's usually referred to as uh, this French word, enjambement. And obviously it is, uh, it is necessary, well, get your leg over, as uh, the uh, French word uh, literally means. Um, <coughs> you, you need to be running on from one line to another, in the sense, pretty often. Again, look at what Virgil or anybody else does, and you'll find very regularly the sense does run on from line to line, and that is desirable. Equally, if you never ever <coughs> stop at the end of the line until the end of your poem, that's also a bit odd. So, I mean, a judicious mixture of stopping at the end of the line, stopping in the middle <coughs> of the line, having a, a striking run on from one line to another, and not doing so, I think um, a mixture of those is uh, what you want. The other thing that you particularly need to pay attention to variety <coughs> of is um, the sort of dactyl spondy ratio in feet one to four. In other words, it gets rather repetitive if you don't have enough dactyls or you don't have enough spondies. I mean, in general, the, the danger is having too many spondies <coughs> because people are often find it a bit challenging to find dactyls, and of course you need a dactyl for the fifth foot anyway. So people can tend to write rather heavy and spondaic lines. 
And one line, that's excellent. Not the slightest problem. Two lines, no big problem. The longer your poem gets, the more of a problem it is if it's not flowing smoothly enough, not enough dactyl. So a bit of a variation in that is, is desirable. As I think I mentioned before, the m of the 16 possible variations of dactyl and spondy in the first uh, four feet, the most common single one, certainly in Virgil, and I should think in most poets, is actually quite heavily, sp sort of more spondies than dactyls. I mean, quite, um, quite spondaic, but with a dactyl beginning to lighten it up. So that's pretty common. Um, any other arrangement with a mixture of the two is is also quite common and desirable. RJ, the I can't remember. <laughs> um, if I be guessing, well, what would I guess? I think I might guess um, dactyl, dactyl, spondy, spondy, probably, maybe, um, maybe. Um, Um, yeah, I mean, this is off the top of my head without scientific proof, but I, I mean, starting with a dactyl is probably more common than starting with a spondy. Um, having at least as many spondies and, as dactyls is normal, so, I mean, actually, um, well, not so uncommon, I suppose, either is, is the quite a dactylic line. But it, it would be normal, given that you're always going to be ending dactyl spondy. It, it really is fairly unusual, and S Virgil would probably only do it for effect, to have all four dactyls. So if you're having quite a dactylic line, then three dactyls and then a spondy in the forefoot to give it a bit of weight about that moment would be quite uh, desirable. Obviously, this is a, a thing to be keeping in your minds as you're trying to write a connected series of hexameters. It should never be the first uh, priority, and the first priority is to make it scan and make it make sense. So beyond that, everything is sort of icing on the cake. But nevertheless, keep your eyes open to this sort of variety, because if you find yourself getting into a rut, then it can be uh, a little bit repetitive. Another sort of variety, which I, I do find I, I, I need to keep, um, to keep thinking about, is... Um, variety of ending type. And by, by type, I mean two things, really. I mean two or three syllables. Obviously, what we're trying to do if we're writing fairly pure and uh, elegant hexameters is to end with a word of either two or three syllables Other things are a bit weird, uh, legal, but not to be encouraged too much. And if you observe the practice of um, well, any decent poet, they do it, but they don't do it that often. So I wouldn't recommend too many monosyllables at the end, and I wouldn't recommend too many four or five syllable words either. So yes, you can do it, but it is best to practice, I think, the more, the more elegant, more, um, more normal two or three syllable endings. So by variety, it's a bit boring if you're always ending with a two-syllable word or you're always ending with a three-syllable word. Again, if you have a look at a page of Virgil, you'll see that he will have the same type of ending um, for several lines in a row. It's perfectly common. But eventually, he will use the other one. I don't know how many lines in a row he would do the same thing for, but you know, it would be unusual to have more than five or six, I think, in most cases. So I think if you find you are writing several lines which all have the same 